Hello, Loveland. How are you this morning? I've got a special guest, and it's Superintendent Nevin, the new uh, newly hired superintendent that is not even officially at work yet, but he is in his office in Loveland, uh, starting early. But uh, you said your first official day was Wednesday. It's coming Wednesday. Yes, that's so, when the contract officially um, starts. This is these are all transition days. They're called. Okay. Well, well, th thanks. I'm really flattered that that I I got to do this interview with you so early into your uh, your term here, your stint here in Loveland. Glad uh, to do it. I, actually, the first question I have for you is, uh, and then I want to give you a chance to just introduce yourself to the community. Okay. Uh, but uh, Steelers, Browns, Bengals. You grew up in Steubensville. <laughs> You're real close to Pittsburgh. You're closer to the Browns. Next question. No, <laughs> right. uh, I no, I'm. I, I yes, I grew up in in Pittsburgh <laughs> or near Pittsburgh, and I am a diehard Steelers fan. And I know that's tough for people around here. Um, well, not just, not for everybody because <laughs> I just love Ben. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and and the other thing is, I'm not a Miami fan because I went to Ohio University, but but I am a Ben Roethlisberger fan. Yeah, I grew up in in Steubenville. Um, and it truly is a steel town, you know, and, and the history of passion for that, that the teams in Pittsburgh has a lot to do with the difficulty with the steel mills and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we all came through adversity together. Um, so yeah, I've been a Steelers fan, although I'll tell you, I, I, uh, I like Joe Burrow a lot and, and uh -huh. I'm hoping for good things for him and the Bengals, except for two weeks of the season. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, ju you just mentioned Ohio University. So you were in the 110? I was in the 110. I was the field commander of the 110. Serious? Yeah. yeah. Uh, my daughter and her husband, um, and and we went to every game once she went, started at Ohio University because okay. her her husband, her his family was really involved. His dad was really involved in the 110. So it went way, way back in their family. So they knew how to get us tickets to all the games and everything. Okay. So uh, you went to the uh, homecoming. You're part of the alumni band. Yes. I've yes. probably seen you. Bro, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this is really interesting. I'll have to ask both of them if they know you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, uh, I went there in 1980 when I graduated high school. And um, OU was, a, it was my vision of what college is supposed to be, the red brick buildings and all that kind of thing. Nobody in my family had graduated from college. I had a couple of teachers who went there. Um, just fell in love with the place. And of course, joined the 110. I was a music major, uh, eventually. I didn't start out that way. Um, but was at OU for five years. And my last year, I was the field commander of the marching band. I'm certain I've seen you then. No doubt. On the field, because no doubt. that was the, that homecoming game. And when the alumni band played at halftime or when they marched down the streets, uh, it was a big deal. Yeah. Because yeah. afterwards, we would go to homecoming too, to see my daughter and son-in-law march and and that okay. was we didn't miss the alumni band because they were part of that okay well there's a connection i'll have to talk to your daughter about this okay <laughs> well well i think that i think that starts some some and people who are watching this getting getting to know you a little bit and, and see your personality sure but, uh, so do you want to talk about your background or, or well just um again from steubenville uh the first from my family to go to college um, Steubenville, as I mentioned, is a steel town. Um, steel mills were shutting down. I had to have an option and I decided on college and I knew doctors and I knew teachers and started out in pre-med, decided that wasn't the route for me. Uh, wanted to go into education. I had been a band kid. It was a good fit. Um, had a great run at Ohio University, some success there and uh, good mentors. Met my wife. Um, she was a cheerleader at OU. So we're, we are Mr. and Mrs. OU. So you can guess where my daughter went to college. <laughs> Not that she had a choice. Um, so anyway, came out of OU and went to, was recruited to teach at Twin Valley Local Schools in Preble County. That's how I ended up there. Taught there for two years uh, as a band director. Left there and went to um, Troutman Madison outside of Dayton. Was there 13 years. My last three years is when I became uh, an assistant principal. Did a lot of work as assistant principal in curriculum. Uh, was actually finishing up my license administrative license and again a lot of work in curriculum 
uh, Trowood was was somewhat of an urban district, so a lot of discipline and uh, alternative programming for kids. Went from there to Bellbrook, and that's interesting because Bellbrook is a similar community to this one. Uh -huh. And was there for three years, um, and then took an elementary position in Eaton, where we lived. Uh, three through five building, did that for two years, and then the superintendent asked me to take the high school principal job, and I just he said I should do it, so I did it. Did that for two years, and then he said, "Hey, I'm retiring. I'm putting your hat in the ring." So I that's how I went into the superintendency. So I did uh, six years as superintendent in Eaton, built some schools, did a major uh, campaign, fundraising campaign, built a new stadium, um, a wellness center, and a auditorium. You know, partnering with local community sponsors. Um, left there, went to Vandalia. Was in Vandalia for. Uh, four years, and that's where I retired from. Had a great experience at Vandalia, and and Vandalia is where I I experienced a lot of what this community has been through with failed levies and a lot of conflict within the community and all. And we were able to get that ironed out. So I feel pretty good about the time I had there. Um, retired from Vandalia and was doing some private sector work for a while for an energy company that um, serves schools primarily. And then after I finished that up, I did just a, a short semester as an elementary principal, kind of helping out my friend there in Eaton at a, at a K2 building, pre-K2 building. Um, and that's where I, I joked with people. I said, I'm certified, but not qualified because the wee little ones scare me. <laughs> but, but I had a lot of fun there. So I did that and, and my wife and I, my wife retired as a teacher. We've been retired now since 2017, really. Um, but right now we're not, you know, we're not able to travel. Obviously it's February and cold, so I'm not playing golf. My projects are caught up. Um, but when I saw this position here, it really pulled at my heartstrings because of, again, the turmoil in the community. And, and I really feel like I can help to try to iron things out. At least I'll, I'll work really hard at it. So that's why I'm here. So, so tell me, uh, do, do you have a sense of why the, disc, uh, why the board Chose you, and so in sense, what what are your um, your walking papers? What are what are they? Uh, what sense do you have of why they hired you and what they want you to accomplish until a permanent superintendent is hired? Um, you know, we had a really good conversation, and one of the things that I said in my first interview, albeit via Zoom, which is just so different to to have these conversations this way, but. One of the things I said is um, there is no more important uh, objective on the table than to get the public engagement back to where it needs to be. So we're actually talking to each other instead of at each other. Uh, and again, I think that's, you get good at what you do. And I've done a lot of that over my career. You know, and I told the board, if, if you want me to help out with your math curriculum, I'm not your guy. Uh -huh. But if you want me to help out with the public engagement side, I enjoy that work. I enjoy listening to people and finding out their perspectives on things. Um, and those are an individual, that's not a community forum. Uh, that, that I'm talking about meeting people in coffee shops here in my office, in their homes, uh, their gathering spots, and just asking questions and, and getting their input. Um, and then giving that back to the board. Um, it's more anecdotal than a survey, but in some ways the data you get from those conversations is much stronger and much more accurate than surveys. So that's really my objective. We have a good team here that's kind of running the show. Uh, in the different departments, I'm confident in the assistant superintendents and the rest of the staff. So my my goal is just to get out there and talk with folks. Okay. Like this. Uh, you, the uh, so you told me uh, a few minutes ago before we started recording that you don't anticipate the school district asking for a levy this year. Um. I, I don't know that. You know, like I said, there's there. I've not been part of any discussions at this point. Um, but you know, that's again, I, I don't start until Wednesday, <laughs> officially. Uh -huh. But um, I've not heard any conversations about that to this point in time. But I also want to be very clear. I don't want people to say, "Well, Brad said it's not going to happen." It just we've had no conversations. So again, I want to be real clear with that. So there's no indication that there is going to be. Not to me, and not at this point. And and. I suspect I'm pretty confident that you haven't had a chance to look into Loveland's finances yet and make just from a, the cursory look I could do during my research and and um, the little bit of time I've had to spend with Kevin Lolly 
Um, I kind of, I kind of, I, I have a pretty good idea, Kevin Holly. I'm sorry. I have a pretty good idea, uh, again, of the overview, but um, we'll be spending more and more time as we get into it and getting more detail. So, um, part of part of what's going on, um, sort of outside of the the district right now, is a discussion at the state house about school financing, and that certainly puts the district in every district in, in a really hard spot because the governor has punted and said basically school funding is going to remain the same, the amount of dollars is going to remain the same, and he's going to wait and see what the legislature does about uh, making the formula more equitable. So that that puts everything in flux right now. Um, but there, there, so do you have any comment about that or what your thoughts are about? Uh, well, honestly, David, one, on of the reasons, yeah, one, of the, one of the reasons why I retired, um, I wasn't, I had a, a great run at Vandalia. I, I loved the board, the community and all, but I had found myself getting more and more frustrated with the school funding model and the legislation that was coming down from the state. And, and I'm not saying that the legislators don't have good intentions, but we need to make a concerted effort as a state to figure out how to fund schools. Um, and that, again, that's part of the reason I retired. I jokingly say I found myself saying things to legislators that my Baptist mother would not be proud of. <laughs> and, um, and it was just out of frustration. And, and in Vandalia, it was similar to here the local taxpayers were carrying way more of the share of the burden to, to educate their children than what they should be. Um, communities such as this one, where um, there's not a whole lot of industry, then the homeowners have to pick up that share. And there are so many different variables in there in terms of you have senior citizens on fixed incomes that whose property values are going up, that, that they're having to pay taxes to, to fund the schools and other things. There's the variable of, of um, being here in this county and having large urban centers where there are services that the local taxpayers here are paying for and they're not using those services. So you pile on top of that the school funding um, and it just gets to be really burdensome. So um, I can go on all day about the funding model. The bottom line is it was found unconstitutional years and years ago and it needs to be fixed um, so that we're not going back on the ballot every few years to, just to be able to maintain our programs. So. Well, the, there is discussion now um, at the Ohio House to uh, to fix it now, but we've heard that over and over again over the years. So we'll have to see, but it's still going to it's still going to take a while. Um, so part of that discussion is what are your views about funding going to private schools, um, uh, for profit schools, the money that people will say takes away from funding public education? Well, I think um, I understand the argument, especially with, with private schools. You know, parents who say, I want my child to go to my local parochial school and I want some of my tax dollars to go there. I understand that argument. Um, I experienced a lot of frustrations with going off to charter schools per se, when the charter schools weren't providing the same level of education that the local public schools were. Um, this is an excellent school district, and and I would venture to guess, now I need to do more research on the local charter schools per se, and I'm not talking parochials, I'm talking local charter schools. Right. I'd venture to guess that the majority of the local charter schools cannot provide the same level of education that our staff here at Loveland can. The other side of that is that when, when folks vote for their local school district levy, I don't know that they're aware of how many dollars are actually going out to those charter schools. So that's a frustration. And as part of the funding model, that has to be fixed as well. I mean, it really needs to be taken care of and, and that needs to be exposed so that people understand just what they're paying for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, uh, as an aside, you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I don't I haven't seen discussion at state level about uh, putting money into school construction. Uh, it seems like it's all about the operating money but, i uh, think the construct the last i heard again i'm kind of getting back into the mix uh but the last i heard um i don't know that new funding is coming out i mean we may be at a point where where i don't know how much is in the budget in the state budget right now for construction uh really interesting 
when I take a look here and I think we're in the 20 some percent for our share of the state funding. Uh, that's not a whole lot, you know, when you look at construction. And um, quite frankly, there's there's a lot of money in a state project that goes into the bureaucracy of the project. And I can say this having built schools, there's a lot of money that goes into the, the kind of the bureaucracy of the project because you have a whole other layer of uh, folks that are involved in that project just coming down from Columbus. So there's, there's kind of a tipping point there where you say, was it really worth taking the state dollars or not? Um, and I don't know where we stand here on that, but um, so the dynamic there is very interesting. Uh, again, but I just don't know where the funding is right now. It may be that there's very little to cover the projects that are in the pipeline at this point. Well, in, at the local level, uh, money that taxpayers are paying is either going to go for operating schools or construction. Mm -hmm. So any construction money that uh, they're asking local folks for is is basically taken away from the potential for operating mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, did you tell me that um, you're going to be part of negotiations with the teachers during this term that you're going to be? You know, when I first came in, it was interesting. I knew that was going on, and, and I've, I've negotiated on both sides of the table, obviously done several contracts over the years. Um, the teams are in place, and I don't want to do anything to interfere with that dynamic. Um, on both sides. They know they know what their history has been. Um, anything I would do would be out of context. So unless they ask me to go in, I'm not going to push my way in. However, um, I will help out with some, some creative solutions that I've been able to work through in my past if I can. Um, but again, we've got a solid team in place and, and I don't want to interrupt that dynamic. That's a critical part of the operation. And I want to make sure people are comfortable with, with the teams. Is a superintendent normally at that negotiating table? Uh, it depends. You know, I, I always was, but I was in a little bit smaller districts. So okay. I was always part of the negotiation. Um, I've been in negotiations where it was just the treasurer and myself and maybe one principal on the, on the, uh, on the management team. Um, I've been in negotiations where we had one board member. Um, it just depends on, on what model is adopted. Um, and here, I understand board members are involved which is fine, you know, it's, it's whatever works to get the job done, to get the, the problem solving uh, most efficient. And that's ultimately a decision the board makes. Correct. Uh, it's not a superintendent decision. I, I, w I will say though that the, uh, this district leadership, board leadership really relies on superintendent recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, they will, I'm sure you're gonna get that question at board meetings. Mm -hmm. In, in terms of that's how I'm going to vote is what the superintendent wants. Uh, let me let me ask one more question. And um, so Governor DeWine uh, is really pushing to get schools open March 1st. And I don't know if I have a good definition of what schools opens means in terms of what he wants. But in Loveland, we're in a, a blended mode where we have a remote academy and a mm -hmm. lot of students, students and teachers involved in the remote academy. So they're not in the buildings every day. Um, and then we have in student teachers or in person teachers and in person students. Um, so DeWine has said he wants the schools open. And I think this is my interpretation. It's a political promise made and he's going to do everything he can to keep that promise, make that promise happen. So he says schools are going to be open March 1st. Uh, that's his goal. Um, Loveland teachers and staff are going to be vaccinated this Friday, I believe. Correct. Uh, I quickly counted up uh get vaccinations then 28 days approximately you get a second vaccination then 28 days after that you're considered fully inoculated i guess that's a word if i'm pronouncing that right but i'm saying that takes us into april 8th school is going to be out out 53 days after teachers have some protection. 
And that, that actually won't mean they can't transmit the, the virus. It means that they won't, probably won't get sick from it. So school is virtually going to be over with for the school year by the time uh, we have this end of these two vaccination periods. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me I'm right or wrong about that or tell me your thoughts about that, about is, do you know if DeWine is saying that everybody that's in remote now will eventually be in person before the school year is out? And, uh, and that includes teachers. Are teachers gonna be forced now, the ones that have good reasons that they chose to teach remote may not wanna go back in person. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, the first thing I'd say is, um, you know as much as I do, for two reasons. First of all, because again, I'm I'm just getting up to speed, but I'm 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 hearing as much from Governor DeWine as you are, if that makes sense. You know, I'm kind of watching the media and that type of thing, uh, and we have a staff here that, that's that's looking at it. Um, ideally, every student is in school every day. We all know that. I mean, um, this is not face to face. You know, if you would have told me if I would have come in here two years ago and you said, "Hey, Brad, I want to meet via." I want to meet via Zoom, I would have said, what's Zoom and why can't we meet face to face? It's not the same thing. So ideally we can get the kids into school, but we have to be careful about, about the safety of everybody, as you said. So we'll have conversations in those timelines with this inoculation, assuming it goes through. And some of that is based on how Friday goes. Are we getting all of our vaccines? Can will the process work? And then we can start the clock a lot better. Because you know, you hear stories about did all the vaccines get there and all. Um, and then it's going to have to be on a case by case basis, you know, based on when we get that vaccine and we can have those timelines laid out in place a lot better. Our team will talk about what the expectations are. Um, again, the safety of the students and the, and the teachers is absolutely paramount will continue to be. Um, and if I sound like I can't give you a solid answer, it's because yeah. we need to see where we are again, we need to see where we are on Friday. Then I'll get together with our team and say, okay, tell me how you felt this went. What's our plan now that we've got these vaccines? Let's take a look at that clock and see how, how it works. Um, but again, well, it, I, it's part of what my, my counting looking at the calendar today. It was uh, the clock starts on Friday. And then, it, so I don't know the date here, Friday, it's eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, the 12th or something. Mm -hmm. uh, from the 12th of February to March 1st is only a few days. So mm -hmm. certainly not into that 28 day, day period of where even the first vaccine is, is starting to work well. Sure. That's why I, that's why I, I question the timing and, and we'll say it's a political decision, not based on uh, somebody even looking at a calendar. So I, I understand you can't do that either because I think everybody's pretty confused about whether he means everybody will be in person and will be crowding the school buildings more than they are now because there's, there's, and I don't know what the percentage is, but there's not as many students and staff in those schools into those crowded classrooms and stuff right. as it would be if everybody was required to then go back in. Sure, and, and of course he's talking about schools and the experience in Loveland is far different than what it is in some other districts that completely shut down. So, um, you know, I, again, it's not optimum, but obviously the staff and the students and, and the board and the community have done a wonderful job here to, to make the best of a bad situation. That's not been the experience in other places. You know, you hear the horror stories of, of schools that are shut down and, and they have a low percentage of students who are actually logging on to the uh, to the whatever sites they use. And so the, the attendance, meaning, you know, logging on to their classroom has not been good. So I think that's part of the, uh, that's obviously part of the push. Um, we have a little bit more ability to be flexible here because of the fact that um, by and large, our, our community is, is engage, our parents are engaging as they should. And um, our students are, are learning, again, the best they can given the situation. Yeah. Um, so it's those failures that may force Loveland to go back. And I, and I'm not sure if, uh, there's going to be that flexibility, 
at the state house. You know, one size doesn't fit all. Well, well listen, I, I could I could go on forever. <laughs> uh, please please keep in touch uh, with Love the Magazine as March first approaches, and if you find out anything different about, is that going to mean that everybody's going to be forced to go back in? Uh, and even those that have really, really good reasons not to be in school every day. Okay. And, and th thank you so much for uh, talking to me this morning. Thank you. I, I thank really you. appreciate it. Well, and I, I want to say thank you to the community for being so welcoming. Um, it truly is a great town. You know, I mentioned, and I think you had in your article that I have, I have some connection here. I had a cousin that lived here for a long, long time and was always impressed with the community. Um, and again, as you and I mentioned off, or I talked with you offline, I've got a grandbaby that lives in um, Oakley right now with my my daughter and my son-in-law. And um, this is a place that I want them to call home because it's just such a great community and great, great school district. Um, and I want to say that about every district because I'm pretty particular about where my grandbaby goes to school, which you can imagine. But this is a great place. And uh, we'll keep we'll keep communicating and I would encourage anybody if they have any questions or comments at all, please give me a call directly and I'll I'll talk with them. Okay? Yeah. Thanks again. All right, David. Take care. Have a great day. Okay.